Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent. In episode number 80 we covered the basics of measuring current. Today we will continue and measure small currents. In the next video we will concentrate on measuring high currents. Let's start. For the first example we need the bench power supply and an Arduino Uno. I use the UNO with the TFT shield to later use it as a current meter and display our measurements. If we want to measure the current used by this UNO, we just connect our multimeter in between the power supply and the Arduino. As discussed in video number 80, we can do this on the low or on the high side. Let's first use the low side. If we do a low side current measurement, we connect the multimeter between the negative of the battery and the negative of the module. As expected, everything works fine and if the polarization of the multimeter is ok, we measure around 50 mA at 7 volts. But in many projects we want to measure the current with the Arduino itself because we want to use the results in our sketch. How can we do that? Measuring voltages was quite simple because the Arduinos usually have 8 analog inputs. So the obvious is to use one of these pins. So according to the last video we have to replace the multimeter with a resistor and measure the voltage across this shunt. Then we can calculate the current and display it on the TFT. The sketch is simple and fast done. The only question is how we calculate the current if we have the reading of the analog pin. As usual this is done using Ohm's law. Let's assume we want that we are able to measure a maximum of 500 mA. Then 500 mA has to equal 5 volts. For this case the resistor has to be 10 ohms. This is truly not ideal because if our Arduino would use 500 mA, we would lose 5 volts across the resistor. This has two disadvantages. We would not have enough voltage to power the Arduino anymore and the resistor would heat up. The power to dissipate can be calculated and in this case would be 2.5 watts. But anyway, because we have only small currents and the voltage regulator, we can live with the 10 ohms. Let's continue. Because Arduinos have a 10-bit ADC, they read 1024 with 5 volts on an analog pin. To calculate the current, we therefore have to use the following formula. Easy. As always, we do not want to destroy our Arduino. So we quickly check if everything is ok. The datasheet of the processor used says that we must not go below minus 0.5 or above 5.5 volts on any pin. We use our voltmeter to check and measure nearly 500 millivolt as expected. But wait a minute, the voltage is negative. Why? Because the current flows from the Arduino back to the battery, the voltage is negative compared to ground of the Arduino. But the analog to digital converter of the Arduino can only measure positive voltages. And if the current gets a little bigger, we even destroy our UNO. Not a good solution. Normally in this case we would just exchange the cable of our multimeter and get a positive reading. But as we learned in the last video, if we would do that with the Arduino we would shorten the shunt and always get a zero reading. But fortunately I have a very precise 16-bit ADC, the ADS1115. Let's check this one. It costed nearly as much as the whole Arduino, so it must be better than the built-in ADCs. But a short check of the datasheet shows that it has exactly the same problem. It is only usable for positive voltages. So I think we are stuck. As a last resort, we consult our Bible for Electronics, purchased in one of the last mailbags. And really, we find a solution to use a simple operational amplifier or op-amp. 
Here they propose a general purpose LM358A. But because these op-amps are not optimized for our case, it needs some compensation circuitry to zero the reading if no current flows. Luckily we get much better suited op-amps for our purpose. If we use the tiny AD8028 op-amp, for example, we can get rid of nearly half of the components. Why did I choose the AD8028? There are a few reasons. First, it can be used with a single supply voltage of 5 volts. The early op-amps were designed for split voltage and higher voltages of, for example, plus minus 12 volt, which means 24 volts in total. And our Arduino has only 5 volts power supply. Second, it is rail to rail, which means its output can go to both rails, 0 and 5 volts. Many op-amps can only go close to the rails, for example from 0 0.2 to 4.8 volts. And third, it is zero drift, which means that we can avoid the components to adjust the zero point. Because we have to use an op-amp to solve our problem of negative voltage, we can use it also as an amplifier of, let's say, a factor around 100. With this amplification, we only need 5 volts divided by 100 equals 50 millivolts across the shunt. Very good, because we can reduce the shunt to only 0 0.5 ohms, which will improve our design considerably. So with the 50 milliampere, we expect now a voltage of 2.5 volts. Let's check. Luckily, everything works as expected or, as the engineer would say, as planned. Now we can connect this output to our Arduino A0 pin, adjust the formula and voila, we have a working low side current meter with our Arduino. Now let's do a little blinking with the LED. Now the display starts to show instable values. If we really want to know what happens, we either have to increase the speed of our program or we have to use an oscilloscope. But you know how to remove a delay statement in a sketch and I save the usage of the oscilloscope for a later experiment. So we can go on. We are now able to measure milliampere. Now we want to go on and measure smaller currents. For example, I have a polar heart rate watch with two different sensors one with the proprietary transmission protocol and one with an additional Bluetooth transmission. I want to understand why the one with Bluetooth discharges the battery much faster than the one with the Polar protocol. So let's check both. As we learned in our last video, measuring small currents is not a domain of multimeters, even not of the expensive ones. This is why Dave Jones from EEV Block created a small device, the microcurrent gold. Gold in this case not only means quality, it means also price. It costs, including shipping, around $80. But for me, it was obviously worth the money. It includes three shunt resistors and a fixed 100 times amplification with a maximum output voltage of plus minus 1.5 volts. Because it uses a coin cell battery, it has no behind the scenes ground connection. The three shunts result in three ranges, milliampere, microampere and nanoampere. The respective shunt resistors are shown in this table. It starts with a stunning small 10 milliohm and ends with 10 kilo ohm for the nanoampere range. So the maximum currents are plus minus 1.5 ampere in the first, plus minus 1.5 milliampere in the second, and plus minus 1.5 microampere in the most sensible range. And the voltage drop is always only 15 millivolt. Please be aware that the ranges differ by a factor of 1000. This is completely different than in a cheap multimeter where your ranges differ usually only a factor of 10. I do not know if you can destroy anything if you select the wrong range, but it fooled me because in overload situations 
the output voltage starts to oscillate if you overload the device. Before I discovered my error, I thought the device was defective. So we use the low side method and feed the polar pulse sensor with the same battery just removed from the case. The microcurrent is connected like a multimeter and because I suspect varying currents, I connect its output to my oscilloscope. We immediately see that the pulse sensor has lots of current spikes of 1.4 mA. They are short, but they do not switch off immediately after the device is not used. The sensor should start when there is skin contact between the two poles and should sleep if this contact is no more there. After a while, the sensor enters real deep sleep and we have to switch the range of the microcurrent. Now we can see that it consumes a constant 1.2 microampere. Now let's compare this number with the sensor without Bluetooth. During activity, the peaks are only 0.45 mA. This is roughly one third of the Bluetooth sensor. But more important, it stops nearly immediately if the skin contact is no more there. Then it enters into deep sleep mode and also here we can measure a lower current consumption, about 0.6 microampere which is also half of the Bluetooth sensor. But I think the huge difference in battery life does not come from there. I think it comes from the fact that the Bluetooth sensor sometimes does things which are not necessary, but use lots of energy if another Bluetooth device is in its proximity. So you see with Dave's amplifier, we can measure quite small currents. And if we connect it to the oscilloscope, we are even able to see changing currents. You see, I did not do any precautions to reduce noise, which would be necessary if we want to measure lower currents. For my experiments, measuring one microampere is sufficient. So we started on the low side with the normal shunt and the multimeter. But quickly, we discovered that we need an amplifier to reduce the size of the shunt and change the polarity of the output. We were able to build a simple amplifier using a well-suited op-amp. For measuring smaller currents, we could go on with our own amplifier, but I choose to use the microcurrent gold. With this device, we were able to measure deep sleep currents of two different heart rate sensors to find out that the main difference between the two sensors is the behavior of the sensor with Bluetooth if it is not used. Measuring on the low side is the preferred method for small currents. However, we always need a resistor between the two grounds, the battery ground and the device ground. And sometimes this is not what we want. Then we have to go to the high side. But this and also the whole effect sensors will be the topic of a future video. I hope this episode was useful or at least interesting for you. Bye.